through 6. Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. We're gonna, I'm going to use slides today. I haven't done that in a while, but I'm going to use them today for this one. And over the next two to three weeks, I'm going to deal with violence in the land. And then next week, we'll be looking at Ezekiel 16, which was the fall of Sodom. What were the sins behind the fall of Sodom? And they were not the sexual sins. And you've, I did a sermon years ago. Uh, in fact, Express News ran the sermon in the paper afterwards. One of their editors was here that day, and it had evidently had a big impact. And so I became a blogger for Express News for quite a while back after that. And so I'm going to do that sermon. I haven't done it since then. I've had it sitting back, but I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to do one on fear not. Uh, do not be afraid. Uh, over and over in the Scripture, I think 23 different people he says, the Lord says to them, do not be afraid. And I'm going to pull all that together in a series. But I'm going to start with this one today because we live in a time that's very, very difficult. But I'm going to start with this. Uh, in two weeks, a week from Wednesday, on a Wednesday night, uh, Dr. David Woods will be here. Didn't even know who David Woods was. I was hosting this for a friend of mine. And I said, yeah, he can come share his testimony. And then when I was on the ship going on a cruise back in uh, September I noticed two or three of you had posted things on Facebook about the death of uh, Nabil Qureshi, and I didn't even know who he was. I just hadn't really paid much attention to all of that. Well, Nabil Qureshi, who died in the ages of 30 from cancer, is one of the great apologists for the Christian faith in the Muslim world. In fact, the Muslim world, Alejandro was telling me after last Sunday, the Muslim world is just attacking him on Twitter and everything else. He died because his God could not keep him alive. Because he switched to Christianity, that's why he died. David Woods is being destroyed now because he's the one who led Qureshi to Christ. And so they're praying, the Muslim world is praying for David Woods to die of cancer like Nabil died of cancer. But anyway, I want to know who this guy was because a lot of you were already following it, paying attention to it and everything else. So I've been reading, um, is it Seeking Allah, Finding Christ? And I'm almost through. But you know one of the most difficult reasons he had trouble coming to Christ out of the Muslim faith? David Woods played a profound impact on him with his sharing of the truths of God's word and the using of the gospel and everything else. When he got to the point, when he is studying the gospels and he is to that point, is this thing about Jesus real or is it fake? You know why he, it took him forever to come over? And it's very hard anyway for a Muslim to come to Christ because of family connections and everything else. But it was because Christians could not explain to him what their scripture said. He said that the key thing that he needed to know was, is Jesus Christ truly the Son of God? He is God who became man. And over and over, believers could not give him an answer. Yes, he's the Son of God. Why? Tell me a scripture. And not a soul could tell him over these years. So he took that, you, that, that we would have no idea what we believe and that our Bible says absolutely nothing about it. That wasn't one or two times because he was a true seeker of trying to figure out what it was. And nobody could give him a straight answer from believers wherever he went. And he didn't attack you. He wasn't mean at you. He asked legitimate questions for somebody he was truly trying to seek. And nobody could give him an answer. David Woods, in reaching out to him one day, said, Read, read the Gospel of John. Read the Gospel of John, which is where you want to send anybody who is seeking, correct? Because the Gospel of John explains who Jesus is, and it's for people coming to faith in Christ. It's the one place you send people. When you get into the first chapter, first verse, in the beginning was, the Word was with God, and the Word, yes, Verse 14, the Word became flesh. The Word of God became flesh. In the Muslim Quran, the Word of God is Jesus. He said Christians didn't even know enough to direct him to John 1.1. 1, 1. He came to Christ because of John 1.1. 1, 1. Toughest decision he ever made, but that's what brought him along. Okay, why would I start with that since I'm doing violence in the land? Because Hosea deals with this. Hosea does explain this. Probably better than anyone else. That's why I picked this. Now, I don't know how well our slides are going to work. because There they go. The Las Vegas tragedy. 
I know that the sheriff of Las Vegas right now had a very bad press conference today because he is so flustered over trying to solve this, he can't come up with an answer. There is no answer to this one so far. If there is, they haven't explained it to the public or to those of us who pay attention to the news and everything else. There's absolutely nothing. But that night had to be the most horrific tragedy to ever walk through. To be at a concert. How many of us have been at concerts at one time? They're just enjoying the music and having a great time. And then suddenly, noises. And no, no big deal. The band's doing this. Or there's fireworks going off or that. But then seeing people drop all around you. And close to 600 people before that night was over with were hit by the sniper's bullets as they rained down all those bullets on top of them from those windows upstairs there in that hotel. And yet we're not shocked by any of that kind of stuff. I mean, you go back seven years ago and what do we have? Sandy Hook. I still can't fathom Sandy Hook. A 20-year-old little boy walked into a school and killed, I think it's 20 kids, six adults, his mother before he started the whole thing. You know what the two had in common? Sandy Hook and Las Vegas. To this day, they don't know why this kid did it, nor will they ever figure it out. I don't know if you know, but he planned that to perfection. He laid it out in complete detail. We know about Vegas, what? He laid it out in complete detail. He knew exactly what he was doing. Neither one of this gave any indication anything was about to happen until it took place. But Sandy Hook up to Vegas, no answers. And may never be any answers before it's over with. Now Ferguson, we do understand Ferguson a little bit, but we don't understand the divide that is brought into our nation. When that young man was killed by the police officer, it split the nation. It really did. I was given the unbelievable privilege of being able to be a part of, of a of a conference in Dallas and Orlando, Florida, where the top black leaders of America and the top evangelical leaders of America sat down at the table and tried to solve what's going on in America when it came to these kind of issues. But the violence that runs now through the land because of this, and we didn't come up with much of a solution even then. I mean, I was sitting there with some of the most famous people in the room. Everybody in the room is somebody you've seen in the news trying to come up with answers of how we tone down the violence. But since then, with the killing of police and everything else that's taking place, the violence has escalated throughout our land. And then the military was not even been exempt from this, guys, those of you who serve. Fort Hood, several years ago, we still remember when the news began to break of the many who were killed. Over 30-some people were shot. I think 13 died, if I remember my numbers correctly. But I just picked four things, from military to everything else, to unexplained to explain but no answers to religious type of reasonings underlying all of this. So each one of them had different motivations behind it that led to all of this. But that still leaves me going, what's going on? What's happening? Is there an answer? I'm not going political today at all. I'm going theological. Because political will not solve this. It's a theological issue. It's an issue of the heart. And it's really something to do with what I started with when it came with David Koreshi. Or Nabil Koresh. Would you stand with me? I'm going to read the scriptures. You follow in your Bible. They will be on the screen, but you have your Bible open because I'm going to reference these things. Here's what it says. Listen to the word of the Lord, sons of Israel. For the Lord has a case against the the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness. There is no kindness. There is no knowledge of God in the land. But what there is, swearing, deception. Murder, stealing, adultery, the employing of violence. Really, the word employing means splitting up the place into just violence here and there everywhere. The employing of violence, so bloodshed follows bloodshed. The land mourns. People are hurting when this goes on. Everyone languishes. It affects everything from the beasts of the field, the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea. I mean, it, has, it can have such a profound impact when a land gets like this. And yet here he begins to go on to solution. Don't let anybody find fault now. And let nobody offer correction. In the Hebrew, let nobody offer correction to everybody else. For your people are those who contend with the priests. And you're going to stumble by day. And the prophets also are going to stumble with you by night. And, and really powerful word here, your, your mom's going to be destroyed. This is going to take place in Israel. This is Israel. This is a ten tribes. So there's going to be a complete collapse going on at this particular point. Why? My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. 
I could just stop right there, say a prayer, and let you think about that one. Because that's it. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. You've rejected my knowledge, so I'll reject you from being my people or my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will forget your kids. Scary words. Let's walk through those this morning and see where they take us. Father, thank you for the day and for the privilege and honor to stop. Not to do something political this, this morning, but try to understand what's wrong in the hearts of, of people. Theologically, what's involved in all of this. Because it has a powerful impact on who we are and how we should respond. So my prayer today is, Father, that you'll lead and guide us. Give us insight and understanding so we'll know what is expected and how we should respond. Now watch over and guide us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The opening is very simple. Listen. It has always been God's word to his people that we listen, that we really hear what's going on. Listening is an effort you have to make. It's not something that just happens. You've heard me say over the years, you, you, you hop into your car, you're driving on 410, you're going somewhere, and you've got a, maybe a talk show on, a news on, or maybe you're listening to a song and you hear your favorite songs getting ready to come on next. And so there you are waiting in anticipation. Or the news says that in a little bit, when we come back for commercial, we will deal with this story. And you go, I want to hear what they have to say about that story. And so you're driving along, and all of a sudden, something catches your attention. Something's happening over there. They're building a building, or they're, somebody's doing something. And so you're watching that as you're driving and everything else. Or maybe some of you suddenly think, I can need to text somebody. So you're texting. I know you never do that on the freeway. But you're just texting along, going down the freeway, and everything else. And then all of a sudden, you hear the person on the radio go, and that's the story. And you go, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute. I, I, several times, I've, I looked at the radio, and I want to go, hey, Siri, could you back it up? It don't work that way. Siri doesn't have anything to do with my radio, and there's no rewind button, even with digital radio nowadays, and so I miss a story. You know what always amazes me about that? My radio was not turned down. My radio was as loud as it was when I was listening to it. It's amazing to me that you can have that much noise and that much clarity and never hear anything ever being said. Right, men? We won't go there. That's a different sermon. Different sermon. But it is. So when God says, listen, listen, he's got something he wants us to say. It's speaking to your children when some things are off base. And you know, listen, you need to sit down right now because we're going to have a talk and you need to hear what i got to say. That's what's going on. And what he's going to tell them in verse 1 is, I have a case against you guys. i got a case against all of you, the inhabitants of the land. Nobody's exempt from what I want to begin to explain to you as we have this conversation. Now, back up a minute. Who's Hosea? A prophet who had a tough situation. He had to marry an adulterous woman, a very bad woman. God called him to do that. They had three kids. He gives those kids, don't ever name your kids after Hosea's kids. Those are not good names. They're about the destruction and the fall apart of the nation of Israel and everything else. But he had to do that. What did his wife do in appreciation for everything he'd ever done? Had affair after affair after affair. Slept with anyone and everyone who ever came along. When you get to chapter 3, God tells Hosea, you go get her again and you bring her home. And you have no relationship with her, but you keep her at home. And you bring her back and you show her love. Because that relationship between Hosea and his wife is a picture of God and Israel at that particular point. And so in chapter 4, he's explaining, now after you've had that introduction of those three chapters, he's explaining what's wrong and what he has against the people of God. So that now leads me, hopefully, whoa. I haven't done this in a while. Here's the problem. And this is his case. There's nobody faithful. You can't count on anybody anymore. When it comes to the nation of Israel, nobody stays with their word. Nobody fulfills their responsibilities. Faithfulness is one of the first things to go when a, things begin to go downhill. You can't expect somebody to show up on time. They just never know when they're going to be there. They'll show up when they want to. Or they take responsibilities. I'll be glad to help you in, at church or over at the school or over this. But then they don't show up. 
It's just a lack of commitment towards anything and anyone else. Because what happens is with no faithfulness, and the word kindness in the Hebrew means no loyalty, no real commitment to relationships. What you've got going on at this particular point is what I call a lack of humility. You're just not that important to me. This situation really is not that important. It's how I feel at the moment, how I want to respond at the moment. That's what dictates me. It's no longer commitments, no longer loyalty, no longer faithfulness. And the land now has none of this. Why? Because there's absolutely no knowledge of God now in the land. It's been a gradual collapse. You're familiar enough with Israel. If you go up to Dan in in northern Israel, I, I was there about a year ago. When you go up there, the land changes. And when you get up the north, it becomes very, with a lot of woods, mountain, uh, all kinds of stuff. The mountains get even bigger than they are in the southern part. And it's a very beautiful area. And you get up into uh, uh, several of the cities there around Dan and some of the other places. And you see the Jordan River just getting started and the greenery and everything. It's beautiful. Uh, Caesarea Philippi is one of the prettiest places ever. It's where um, the gates of hell are. And you get walking around and you, you enjoy all of that. And you even come around uh, this road and we drive a little bit. And we come up and there is a, literally from the Abraham's day, the gates to Dan. They're still there. The gates to the city of Dan are there. The ones that, uh, they, that Abraham went through when he went to get Lot and his kids... He walked through those gates. It's, they just found it recently. It had been totally covered. They found the entire thing, and they're excavating it. So you're going, boy, this is, when you're doing this kind of stuff, boy, this is neat. I've read this. I know all about this. This is fascinating, getting to see it with your eyes. But then we came around a little bit, and we stop, and we get out. And there is a metal frame, real big metal frame, probably from the floor up to here, and almost as wide as the middle pews here, back about four pews. It's just a big metal frame. That's the altar that Jeroboam built. Part of it is still there. He put the golden calf on top. Now, you've got to know your Bible. If you don't know your Bible, you have no idea what I'm talking about right now. But this is important. That's where Israel began to fall. That was their downfall that they later on will totally collapse. It started in an insignificant little type of thing. But what happened was Jeroboam didn't want the people going back to Jerusalem because that would keep them tied into Rehoboam. So he set up his own worship up north. So they either went to Bethel in the southern part, they went all the way up to Dan, and most went to Dan. And when they would go there, they would just offer a sacrifice to this little golden calf. It was only about that big, sitting on top of this massive altar, and that's where their worship was. They put in place priests who were not priests. You know how you became a priest in Israel during this time? I want to be a priest. Does it pay good? Yeah. What are your qualifications? I ain't got any. I just want to be a priest. It's your job. That's literally how this went on. So people were serving and doing these jobs. They had absolutely no knowledge of the Torah. They had absolutely no knowledge of what the prophets were doing. They had absolutely no knowledge of how sacrificial systems work. And they were given leadership. And so when you have people and they're not focused on the things of God, over a time period, what happens? There is absolutely no understanding, no ability to be able to know who God is. And when there is no knowledge of God, then life takes a negative turn. Because what happens is you're dictated not by thought and mind and reason in a good way, making right decisions, rationally good decisions based on what God's Word says. I make my decisions based on emotions. And so what happens is eventually this is what you end up with. Here's what the land is filled with, swearing. Now, this is cursing. It has more to do with, I hate you, and I hope your life totally falls apart. But language always falls apart when you pull God out of it. And just walk through any construction site, walk through any business today, and the language that you're going to listen to is never going to be good. And you go, that's not that big a deal. It is. Your language is a reflection of what's inside. What's in your heart comes out of your mouth. That's what's amazing about Jesus. There was no guile, no hatred ever found in anything he ever said because of his purity of his heart. And so when you've got that, but then you have deception. And boy, we live in a day of deception and lying. I mean, we don't even trust, most of us in the room don't trust anything our press writes. Half of them have been called half the time. And now Hollywood has just shown how f- shallow and hypocritical they are with everything that's been unfolding. Murder begins to take off like crazy and 
Chicago would be a perfect example. We've always had cities like this, but across the land, it's gotten more with the killing of our police and everything else. I mean, look at how many murders take place in San Antonio on a regular basis. I don't even like watching local news because that's the first three or four stories almost every single night when we turn on our TVs and knowing several men who serve in the police department. They keep me informed on some of the things that are going on and everything else. Murder, stealing. I live in a gated community with fairly nice homes. Every one of us have been burglarized in that neighborhood. Every one of our homes have been hit at one time or the other and some two and three times. I guess they think if you've got a gate at your front, you must have money, but everybody's like me. They just barely get by, paycheck to paycheck and everything else. I mean, we've had them break into Jonathan's truck and steal his sound equipment out of several thousand dollars. My neighbors had them break into their house. My neighbor on the other side had them break into their house. Stealing becomes unbelievable. And adultery, immorality goes to record levels. And we're at record levels in this country. We may have been bad in the 60s and 70s. We not even begin to touch what's wrong right now. Sexual disease is at an all-time high to levels we can't even begin to fathom. And Donna's shaking her head because we treat many of those here in San Antonio. We do that. We're the ones responsible for the treatment. So we know what's going on. We know what's happening. And we hear the stories of all that's unfolding. That's what they have going on in Israel. Have you noticed, too, if you look at that, doesn't that kind of look like the Ten Commandments? That's five of them. He lists five. See, that's, that's what you see when people forget who God is. And so what happens is you employ violence. Why? Why does violence start showing up with this? Because you know what that does? When you deal with people who, who, who may curse at you, when you deal with people who lie at you, when you deal with people who hate you, or you deal with people who are taking advantage of you or trying to take what you've got, or you deal with people who are living unbelievable moral lives and it has a negative effect even on you and your family, what's your attitude? What's your response? If you're normal, you know what your response is? Anger. You become very angry at what's going on. And most people can't handle anger. Most allow their anger to get totally out of hand. And if you have no knowledge of God, you have no filth and no protection to keep you from overreacting to the anger that gets in you. And so you'll hear stories, well, I can't believe he'd ever done anything like that. But if you get into it, you'll find out it's been building and building. And so as the, as the anger gets greater in the land, the violence becomes more. And then it's just bloodshed follows bloodshed. There's a story here and a story there and a story there. And so what happens? We just mourn. I hate turning, I, I, you know, I'm a news junkie. I hardly, I just hard to watch news right now. With everything that's going on, it's just hard to see what goes on. Because it does. It, you can't watch Vegas and go and not break your heart. You can't go back and think about the Sandy Hook story and it not break your heart. You can't look at the violence that's on the streets sometimes and it not break your heart. That's what mourning is. And it causes a languishness, a slowing down, a tiredness, a frustration, and everything else begins to build. And that is not the way to live. But when you begin to pull God out and allow human nature to take over, you end up going farther and farther downhill. So the million dollar question this morning that the preacher needs to answer in 10 minutes, is there a solution? Well, first of all, God's going to say, let no one find fault and let no one offer reproof. First thing you got to do in order to make any impact or change whatsoever is quit blaming everybody else for what's wrong. I mean, we're all good at that. We can sit down on the television and we'll listen to our favorite political pundits and be right there with them, yeah. And so one side will go this way and the other side goes this way and we'll just talk past each other. It's a pointing of fingers. Just like that little kid's doing in that picture right there, pointing to the finger. It's y'all's fault. It's not his. But God says, quit finding fault with everybody. I don't know about you. I always get tired. I listen to people who are always running everybody else down. I, I don't even want to see them show up sometimes, even come around, because they're so negative on everything that goes on. And he said, quit offering correction to everybody else. Quit pointing your finger at others. You know, my mom, stupid little things you say, son, when you point a finger at somebody else, you got three pointing back at you. It always was stupid to me, but there seems to be some truth in all of that, does it not? So what's the solution? Well, God says in verse 4, it's with you, that's my contention. I'm, I'm, I'm coming to talk to you, he says, to my people. 
I'm not talking the ones out in the world. I'm talking to my people. This is what I want you to listen to at this particular point. Because you're stumbling. You're going to go down with everybody else. And your religious leaders are going to stumble with you. And they're going to fall with you because there's no knowledge of God in land. And they don't have any more than anybody else does. So all of you are going to go stumbling. So why the violence and the stumbling? My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Just let it sink in. This isn't the world out there he's speaking to. He's speaking to believers. We're destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Go back to my Cuba story when I'm preaching in Pinar del Rio and I say Philippians 2, 3 through 11, and, and the guy in Spanish says to his congregation, as they, as I thought he was just going to read to them the entire thing. Repeat with me Philippians 2, 3 through 11. And the entire congregation of 700 people rep- replied back to me without their Bibles open by memory exactly what was there. When I teach in the seminary classes with their young seminarians who are just the young kids in their churches who are thinking God's called them in the ministry, and I'll make a comment. I say, you know what Paul says in, in Philippians 1.6, and they'll quote it right back to me in Spanish immediately. Or I might say Matthew 5, and they'll repeat, do the entire Beatitudes to me on the spot they just start talking. They just say it back to me. And I'm always amazed at that. Puts me on really good. Make sure I'm ready when I stand in front of the class because they know their stuff. They know it unbelievably well. And I come to my seminary class here in America and I'll offer a similar type of thing. And my kids won't even know what I'm talking about. Kids growing up in American church that are called to ministry and walk in the seminary, nine out of ten of them have absolutely no idea what's hardly even in there other than what they picked up in a Sunday school lesson. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And the reason is because we're really not interested. We're really not interested. We'll do church on Sunday. We'll do this occasionally. But when it really comes down to knowing, what is eternal life? We spent 11, 12 weeks just doing what eternal life is in 1 John. John 17, 3 tells us what eternal life is. Eternal life is what? Say it again. Knowing God and knowing Jesus. So to reject the knowledge about God is to reject Him. And what happens is you forget, verse 6, you forget the law of God. See, if I don't spend time enough doing it, I am not going to remember it. It's an impossibility to be able to do that. Yesterday... My football teams were getting swamped by everybody, so it was not a good day to watch football on TV. But my Astros, yeah, they took the Yankees out again yesterday. You, it's, a, it's a childhood dream for the Yankees and Astros to play each other in the American League Championship. I'm an Astro fanatic, but the Yankees were my team, and so I'm locked on that game watching it. But the way it ended, you got a little guy, I made reference to him last week, Altuve. Uh, he, he looks like a hobbit. He's five foot six. He's the best hitter in baseball. He is unbelievably the best hitter in baseball for the last four years. And he is on first base, and there is a couple outs. Game is 1 1, and they hit the ball. It goes into right center. It's going to be a, a double. So we're going to have runners at second and third. But that's not what Altuve thought about the game yesterday. When he left first base, he never slowed down until he slid in the plate in the most dramatic finish to an American League championship game you could ever want, and he got in there. They were asking about it later. He said, well, I just knew I could get there. I just have the confidence. He knows the game. He knows who's in right field. He knows what his arm's like. He knows so much about the game. He knew exactly what to do. See, when we don't know and we don't spend time, then we don't know what it is, and you get at a critical moment where you can see God do some of the most amazing things in life, but you don't do it. Why? Because you don't know what to expect. You don't know how to react. Why? Because we've forgotten. And if you don't spend time doing it over and over and learning it and making it uh, internally what's going on in your life, you won't remember this stuff. And the older you get, the less you're going to remember. It's just part of getting older sometimes. If it's not been ingrained in you, then it leaves you completely behind. He says, my problem is you rejected me. And so you have forgotten what I've said. So what's the danger of forgetting God? See, I still haven't given you a solution. Because he doesn't give one here. 
The danger is, he says, I will forget your children. And you go, oh, that's cold. But whose fault is it? Whose fault is it? It's the people of God. You know why we ought to be doing whatever we do to stand for that which is righteousness and that which is good? Why? Why do we do that? We do it for our kids and our grandkids. We do it for our kids and our grandkids. If you and I cannot stand up and protect our kids and our grandkids, there's not much about us that's worth even paying attention to. If you can't get enough courage in life and enough hunger in life, we do it for our kids and grandkids. And what do our kids and grandkids need from us more than anything else? They need us to be halfway decent people in life who strive and try to be what God's called us to be, who when they come to us with something, know the Word of God well enough that we can give them a biblical answer. And when their hearts begin to move off in directions they shouldn't go, we're there out of love and concern to try to keep them on the right path. And we understand human nature. We understand the biblical truths enough that we can sit there, not in a mean, forceful kind of way, but in a a gentle and very powerful way, expound with them the great truths of what life is about. But be such good people along the way that they have some measure of respect for us that they will pay attention to what's going on. That's what this call is. And when you and I are too busy with everything else in life and we're just coming here and there and we eventually just are living life, popping in and out of church, doing whatever we might do, singing a Christian song in our head or whatever it might be, but we're not learning, we don't understand it, we don't grapple with the truths of God's Word, we wake up one day and we don't know any more than anybody else does. And so when Nabil Qureshi comes to us and says, explain to me why Jesus is the Son of God, we're not even smart enough to say John 1.1, when that ought to be the easiest answer any of us could ever be able to give. And we don't even want to get in a conversation because we know we'll be swamped by whoever's asking us questions, and so we're too afraid because we'll reveal that we don't know anything. And so God eventually one day says, you want to know why there's so much violence in your land? Because nobody knows who I am anymore. And that is part of what's wrong in this country right now but I can't blame everybody else I've got to make certain that Steve knows God I know his word make certain that I do the best I can when I stand in the pulpit with some of you guys and try to explain this stuff that I'm being as close to what it's supposed to be to be as accurate as I can to give to you what God's word says so that I can challenge you to think so it'll be a part of who you are Verse 10 says, I will punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. So there is no solution. But I want to give you a solution and we'll call it. Here's how we turn it around. They're destroyed for lack of knowledge. We've rejected knowledge. We've forgotten the law of God. We stopped giving heed to the Lord. So here's my solution. I think Ezra has it. Ezra 7.10 is something you ought to have ingrained in your head. Ezra, one of the great men in a very difficult day brilliant man what does he do how does he respond and how does he act verse 10 he set his heart to study God's law so my challenge to you today is politically our country will never solve what's going on out there we're split I mean our nation's split right now I mean literally Republicans are split among themselves Democrats are fractured too, and then we fight each other along the way. The last two presidents, Obama and Trump, are now running on their own, separate from the way we've always run government. So you had a Democrat and Republican both doing the same thing along the way. It's a messed up time. I got involved for three or four years, went to Washington a bunch, had a chance to sit with people and talk because of what happened in my own life. I come away after all of that going, they no more have any solutions and no more listen to anything else. There's no change happening there. The the place is too big, too many things wrong. So you come back and say, I just quit, give up. There's nothing I can do. No, there is some things I can do. I can set my heart to know what God's Word says. And so I'm going to have my daily Bible readings. I'm going to study and be ready when I stand in the pulpit. I'm going to sit and reflect along the way because I want to know what's in there. I want to know this. Why? Because I want to be a good good pop-pop, and I want to be a good dad, and I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good man who stands in the pulpit all these years to be able to do what God wants done in all of our lives. But that's going to come when I make a determination. I set my heart. This is what I want. I'm going to go a little long. Tell the crowd out there they can wait. Ron Sweet, who's in our second service, plays the trumpet and rides his bike. 
has this term called non-negotiables. I love, I, he, he's got this down as well as any of us. But he says they're non-negotiables in life. They are part of who we are and what we do every day. And we don't have to think, do I do this today or do I not do this today? They are so important that they're a part of our day no matter what. We put everything else around the non-negotiables. So I want to challenge you. One of the non-negotiables in your life is you set your heart to know what God's Word says. That you study it, you think about it, you reflect. You, you look so you understand. You don't just pull a verse out. My radio program yesterday, I pulled a verse out and began to show why you just can't pull it out. It was Philippians 4.13 was my opening radio program. You just don't pull a verse out and hold on to it. You've got to understand everything that's involved in it that leads up to why he said that. Then the second thing you do is you set your heart to practice it. We don't study and then go tell everybody what we learned. We don't study it so we can go get everybody else's life correct. You study so you become godly. You study so you become good. And you have to practice those things. You have to do them over and over. Nothing comes easy. You put Jan on a keyboard and you let her play. And she'll play anything first time, read it first time. Put me on the keyboard, give me a hymnal, and I will play it. It will be sad. And you might figure out the hymn. You might go, I think that is what a friend we have in Jesus. I'm not quite certain. But if she sits down like she did a minute ago and did that, what's the difference? I took five years of piano. I sit down on it about once every year or two and play a little bit. I'm not any good at it. She has done that her entire life since she's four years of age. She does it every day at the house. She practices for every service over and over and over and over because she set her heart to do that a long time ago, it became a non-negotiable in her life, she has reaped the benefits of sitting there and providing for us something special. You and I, if we don't set our hearts to know it and then set our hearts to be good at it, we'll never get there. Then we're ready to tell others. There is violence in the land. Politically, I don't think there's any solutions. I hope they find something, but I'm not resting my hope on political leaders. But what I'm resting my hope is on is that the people of God wake up and take seriously their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know most of us in the room do, but I mean really make a commitment that this is what we're going to do. And we're going to know his word. Because when you know it, you'll be salt and light. And when you have a family member who's so angry at all the hurt in their life, you can give them an answer. Because you may be the only one who could touch their life in a good way where the rest of us wouldn't even have a shot at it. You know, a lot of times, let's get the preacher, bring him in. I have no more influence and power than anybody else does when you throw me in a situation like that. It's who we know in our relationships that open those kind of doors. Why did the nation of Israel collapse? Because there was no knowledge of God in the land. May that never be said about us. Father, we thank you for this day and for the privilege and honor you've given us to study your word. Now, Father... We've been challenged by Hosea this morning. Not many answers at all in Hosea. It was a time of judgment. You had had enough. And we know later that the nation of Israel collapsed badly. Unbelievably fall, fell hard. Lord, please do a work among your people. We want a land to live in in which our children and our grandchildren can experience life in some good ways and not have to live in fear. Help us, Father, to be the ones who focus on you, who know you, who learn about you, who practice our lives with you every day so that we can teach our kids, so we can teach our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, and they will know who you are. And the violence will slowly dissipate from the land because there will be a knowledge of you throughout. So we're asking for that this day. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're just seeing a verse of invitation.